we can start. We have around 50 people participating at the moment. I hope that other colleagues will join us. We have at the moment 110 people registered from 19 countries to the entire Unimed week, but I hope that this will grow in the coming days and I hope that other colleagues will join us. I, I will say uh, at the end of the session some information about participation and country of participation, but first of all, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, webinar, this first webinar of the UNIMED Week in Brussels. Uh, this is the fifth edition of the UNIMED Week in Brussels. This picture that you see uh, in the screen is uh, uh, the picture of one of the edition of uh, the UNIMED Week. Probably uh, it was uh, the first one. And this was a session in the European Parliament. Uh, every year we organize this uh, event, which is uh, an important event of UNIMED life. We are, as I said, in the, at the fifth edition. Uh, the UNIMED Week in Brussels has, has main goal this um, networking dimension with the European Commission Department dedicated to Mediterranean cooperation. In some way, as I was discussing with uh, Herman Bernard Rios from DG Education, uh, in some way is an occasion to, to listen and to learn more about European policy to, uh, related to Mediterranean cooperation. Uh, on the other side is the uh, opportunity for you as member of UNIMED to offer your point of view to European Commission people about uh, the several programs related to the European, the Euro-Mediterranean cooperation. And for us, for UNIMED, there is uh, an important dimension not only to discuss with our colleagues of European Commission, but to discuss with you and to share uh, common ideas about future initiative and activity. Uh, obviously, I don't have to explain the reason why we moved from uh, a physical event to an online event. All our countries are affected in one, may, one way or another by the pandemic, by the COVID-19. And look at, uh, looking at university life, you know, you know better than me, uh, the consequence of all these uh, universities are almost closed. Uh, courses are more or less doing, are doing online uh, and this is in some way impacting on your uh, activity, but is also impacting the international uh, dimension of our uh, universities. Uh, looking at all these, UNIMED decided not to stop and to uh, just to postpone to next year our activity, but to continue as, as normal. And uh, this is the reason why we decided to have this uh, online uh, dimension. It's not by case that yesterday we have the, the first, in some way, external event to our UNIMED week, which was uh, the uh, Erasmus Plus virtual exchange uh, webinar was not by case because uh, to have as a first webinar, a webinar discussing about virtual in a virtual dimension where we are is quite, uh, for us, quite uh, a message, a relevant message. But it's, it's not also by case that the first webinar of this fifth edition of the UNIMED Week in Brussels starts with the, the European Commission Director General for Education and Culture. Uh, all of you, know uh, the Erasmus Plus program, which is the most important program for the academic cooperation, uh, I have to say, with third countries, European Union countries and third countries, but is more and more important for the Mediterranean region, which is the most financed region in the neighborhood policy of European Commission. Um, you know the impact of two, the Erasmus Plus program from 2014 to 2020. It's not time to make a balance. It's probably we have to wait uh, another couple of years to better understand the impact of all the programs. But I could say I, I was uh, in some way participating in the preparation of the, of the, the current Erasmus Plus 
as a stakeholder, of course, discussing with the previous colleague of Mr. Bernard Rios. And I think that the impact for the region was very, very important. We have now a mobility scheme stronger than before than the previous program, the ICM. We have the capacity building program that all of you know. There are obviously, as usual, problems, difficulties, but there are a lot of very good projects and very good initiatives that are currently running in our region or already uh, done and that produces, produces and are produ producing some effect. Uh, now it's time to reflect on the current program, obviously the impact of all this, but it's time also to reflect on the future of the new program that we start hopefully or at least by law on 2021. Uh, today, that is the 17 June 2020, we start with this webinar. We will have uh, several webinars day by day for two weeks. We decided to have this uh, formula instead to have, as usual, just three days of meeting in Brussels. Uh, the online formula give us the opportunity to go more, uh, uh, to use more time, more days, and to spend just a couple of hours per day. I hope that this is not affecting uh, too much uh, your agenda. I can't rescue you for the people that didn't know, didn't do at least until now to present yourself uh, in the chat by name and by country to create in some way what it's very difficult to create in a virtual dimension, some networking and dimension. And just as a last uh, instruction, we are going to record the webinar and everything will be available after the webinar in our uh, Unimed uh, website. Uh, the speaker of today, is uh, Mr. Herman Bernard Rios, uh, which is in charge of international cooperation at uh, the, the Director General for Education and Culture. I already mentioned you uh, the importance for all of us of Erasmus Plus program. There are several important uh, news about the future, the reflection at least about the future program. Uh, the commission is used to say, and I hope that this slogan remain evolution but not revolution and I give him uh, the floor to uh, to talk about uh, uh, about uh, uh, the the movement about the, the, the Erasmus plus program we have also with us uh, and Lorenzo Pastorini and Silvia Marchionne from Unimed uh, team that some of you already know for the projects that we manage in our with our members then i give the floor to herman for his uh, presentation and after that we will open uh, the door for questions and uh, i hope a very rich intense discussion please herman thank you marcello so hello from brussels i hope that you all can see and hear me well I try to stay in about 30 minutes for the presentation and then we have time for questions, no? So I'm going to try to share my presentation. I hope it works, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share my desktop. And then the presentation. Okay, okay, it should work, no? Okay, so today I'm going to speak, as Marcello said, about the new Erasmus program 2021-2027 opportunities and challenges. So about basically about the commission proposal for the new Erasmus program, in the, not about the broad proposal, but what interests the South Mediterranean region. But first, even if Marcello said it's not still the time to do the balance, I want to do some balance of what uh, we have done so far, what we have achieved in the current program. Uh, for cooperation in the field of education and youth between the European Union and the Southern Mediterranean countries. So in this first slide, you can see an overview of all the actions of Erasmus Plus that are currently open to the South Med countries. Uh, most of you come from the higher education sector, so you know about higher education mobility, where we have the great mobility or flagship activity, 
which concerns students and staff as well, not only academic staff, but maybe you don't know that we have also traineeships between, uh, since 2018. You also know the Erasmus Mundus Joint Master Degrees in which the European and the partner countries universities can participate and the students can benefit from very good scholarships. We have the capacity building projects. We have the young money activities on European Union studies that are also open to the whole world, including the South Met as well. And maybe you are also, of course, you are familiar with the virtual exchange that I put there under the youth sector. But in fact, it's an activity that seeks to bridge uh, youth and, and higher education. So you probably heard about this yesterday. Uh, but we also have some activities in the youth non-formal education sector, including youth exchanges, mobility of youth workers. We have capacity building activities uh, in the field of youth at this moment, mainly for Tunisia as a coordinator, but all South Med countries and EU uh, uh, member states can participate in it as long as there's a Tunisian coordinator, coordinator. And finally, we have the e-twinning scheme, which is open uh, to uh, partner countries as well in the South Med. This is about pedagogical projects uh, electronically, very, very current also topic between European schools and partner countries and schools. At the moment, only Jordan, Lebanon, and Tunisia have concluded agreements to participate in it, but it's open to all South Med countries in principle. So this is the whole of, uh, panorama of Erasmus Plus with South Med, but today, of course, I'm going to focus on the higher education sector. Uh, just as Marcello said, uh, the South Med is maybe, it's, it's our biggest priority in terms of budget. You can see there in this uh, diagram how, how many mobilities we have had since 2015 uh, when the Erasmus Plus program started. So over 200,000 mobilities, but close to a quarter of that, 22%, uh, uh, are de devoted to the South Med region. As you can see, the, the, the European neighborhood in general is our biggest priority. We have the South Med, we have the Western Balkans and we have the Eastern Partnership. And this almost takes three quarters of our mobilities. If we add Russia, it's more than three quarters. And then we have the rest of the world. So we have uh, a lot of interest to cooperate with, with Asia, with industrialized Asia, with African countries, etc. But our biggest priority for the time being in terms of budget is the South Met. And I think it will continue to be our biggest priority. This is something good for, for, your, for the members of Unimet, of course, because uh, you have many more opportunities to establish Erasmus partnerships than universities from other parts of the world, let's say. Uh, of course, this biggest, uh, this biggest uh, mobility that we have with the South Met is not spread evenly around the country. So here you can see uh, how this is spread. Where well, we have uh, Israel and Morocco really leading the way, also Tunisia is very well represented. And we have other countries, not so much. Why this happens? There is no budget reserved to every country. Actually, this is a demand-based process. It is the European universities that need to submit proposals to cooperate with the partner countries universities. So within the broad regional envelope of the South Med, there is a lot of freedom to, to cooperate with whoever you want, even if sometimes we have incentives in the form of windows. Eh? We have had, for instance, a lot of incentives for Tunisia in the form of additional budget or now we have with Algeria as well. But uh, what we would like to see is a more even or better representation of some countries in particular. Of, all, of course, the biggest countries like Algeria or Egypt, uh, were substantially big countries that are not so well represented, we really would like to see more exchanges. But of course, we are happy to have every exchange. You can see in this diagram, in, in green, you have how many students and staff are moving from those countries to the EU. But in blue, you see also how many are moving from those countries, from, from the European countries to the South Med countries. This is very important for us because Erasmus Plus works as a bilateral exchange program only if uh, both sides benefit. The European universities incentives very often to send a universe, to, to host universities from partner countries is also to be able to send uh, their own students and their own staff. So it's important that your universities in the South Met are uh, really prepared to welcome also these students and these staff that there is a good ex mobility experience for all of them because one mobility leads to the next one, basically. When the students and staff come 
and and they are they agree that they, they, it was a good experience they will they will travel again and they will foster new mobilities in this diagram what you can see is a little bit the same but you can see the evolution uh, of, of the countries uh. so some countries have had a really positive evolution from the beginning uh, some are more uh, stable of course we have countries with a difficult situation such as syria or libya where it's very difficult to progress, but we are working uh, in order to improve the statistics for everyone, really. And in this slide, I just want to tell you about the, the latest activity that we, start, we started in 2018, the Student Mobility for Traineeships. This is an, an activity that exists also in Europe, but when it comes to partner countries, uh, to partner countries, it's only possible for students, for enrolled students. In Europe, we have it also for recent graduates. Uh, what you see here is only those participants that have only engaged in traineeships in the mobility. Uh, from, you have uh, four, 565 that went from the South Met to the EU, but 422 also that did their traineeship in the South Met countries from the EU. What you don't see here is also that there are some participants who did both. They did a period of mobility followed by a period of studies, sorry, followed by by a period of traineeships. They can combine the two activities up to 12 months. That's very interesting too. Uh, here you only see the ones that only went for traineeships, but there are also those that went for study and traineeships. Then I'm um, moving forward to the balance of what we have done in, in uh, capacity building in higher education. We have had so far 744 capacity building in higher education projects in the whole world. This is about the whole world. Uh, and we have 157 coordinators from, from, from partner countries. You know about these projects, they seek to, to work in different fields. There you have the, the diagram describing broadly what they are about. We have many projects on curriculum development, many projects to help modernize the higher education institutions, also projects on relations between higher education institutions and the wider world, and also projects dealing with the system themselves. Uh, you see the difference there between joint projects and structural projects. I would just mention that structural projects as, are those that really focus on the systems and where the ministries of education of the partner countries are involved. You know that these projects, they are rather uh, big. They last normally two to three years. They, they, the budget is close to 1 million euro in most cases. It's in theory between 500,000 and 1 million euro. And we, you can have projects where only one partner country is involved. For instance, many, many universities from Jordan or Tunisia cooperating with European universities. Or you can have also projects where several universities from several uh, partner countries cooperate. And this is something that we really like seeing very often, this regional cooperation uh, through, the, through the capacity building action. When it comes to the participation of, uh, capacity build, of uh, partner countries universities, there you have an overview of how many coordinators from the partner countries we have and how many partners. As I said, we like seeing more and more partner countries being coordinators. And in this table, you can see really how uh, Palestine in particular or Jordan stand out really as, uh, as being coordinators of the projects. So this gives them really the full responsibility of the projects and it's, it's a very good initiative. But of course, being a partner, it's also very good. It all boils down to how do your institutions benefit from the project? Just to mention also a little bit about the Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's degrees. This is uh, a table for the whole world. It continues being a very competitive action. You can see there how many projects are submitted every year and how many are selected. We have more and more projects selected happily because every year in Erasmus Plus, we have had more budget than the previous one. I hope that we continue with this trend. And uh, I will speak later about the novelties for this program in the, in the coming period. When it comes to the scholarships, to the students that benefit from Erasmus Plus uh, scholarships, of course, uh, as you know, this is a worldwide program. So uh, the share of the South Met is not uh, as big as in the ICM regular mobility, because it's really a competition with the rest of the world, with the whole world and it's very much uh, merit-based. It is the students themselves who basically, who apply for the, student, for the scholarships and who on the, based on their own merits obtain these scholarships. 
So of course the picture looks rather different. A, a country of 100 million people like Egypt is really leading the, the way in the, how many is Erasmus uh, Mundus scholarships they have achieved. But we also have many Syrian students that have benefited from this scholarship, something that we are very happy about. But in general, all the countries are represented, as you can see. Just wanted to mention also a little bit about the Yamone projects. You know, the Yamone projects are dealing with European studies, with the studies of the European Union, but they can be of many fields. Very often, uh, you think that it's only about uh, law or economics or European integration in the more traditional fields. We have also projects uh, like uh, seeking to study European cultural policy, but really it's open to any academic field where you seek to build knowledge about European integration in your countries also. The program is open to the whole world and here what you can see is how many program countries, European countries participate in them and how many partner countries participate in them. And you can see that there is a good, very good share of partner countries. I have not included a slide about participation of the South Med countries because sadly it's, it's very low. It's very low and I would like to promote very much the Jan Monet projects in the, in the South Med countries too. I understand it's a competitive program, but it's in the neighborhood where we would like to have specialists and people who know very well about the European integration, probably in the first place. So I really encourage you to, to find out more about Jan Monet and to participate in this program in the future more. So now I will start with a subject that interests you more probably which is uh, the next Erasmus program, 2021-2027. As you know, the commission proposal was submitted in 2018. So this is this graphic that you see there. It's really about the proposal that was submitted in 2018, where the commission proposed to double the, the amount of the funds for the Erasmus Plus program, for the new Erasmus program. That was a proposal then, but probably now it will be called Erasmus Plus. But I want to emphasize this proposal is mainly, mainly about the intra-European dimension. The extra-European dimension is mostly, but not only, funded by another proposal, which is the external instrument, which is called ENDICI, Neighborhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument. But Erasmus remains the framework of our cooperation anyway. Maybe you have read about the latest commission proposal that was submitted on 27 May which is exactly 27.89 billion euro. Just want to mention that we are in the midst of the negotiations, of the interinstitutional negotiations. You know that it is a very difficult period right now for the European Union. There's a, there's a COVID crisis, there's a lot of uh, pressures to really decide on the budget. The Commission proposal seeks to basically honor the, 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 the proposal to double, to double the, the budget of the current program into a new program, also taking into account that Brexit is now a reality. In 2018, when the Commission submitted the proposal, Brexit was really very likely, the referendum had happened, but now it's a reality. So we really have to take into account that there's a country that, a very important country, the very big, that will not participate, at least with this part of the budget in the program. Then we will see with the negotiations if they participate, but then they would have to bring their own budget and we would probably be over the 30 billion euro if they did. But just to mention, basically the proposal is to, to uh, double the, the, the current budget of the program. Sorry, going back. This is not our current commissioner. Our current commissioner is Maria Gabriel from Bulgaria, but I still uh, put the picture of our previous commissioner, Tibor Nagraxix, because he was the one who prepared the, the, the first proposal of the commission the, that we are still negotiating. Huh? So the idea was that after 2020, Erasmus should be bigger, but also better, of course. And I will focus on the issue of inclusive, inclusive accessibility, accessibility understanding as user friendliness of the program, and the one that interests you more probably, which is making Erasmus more international. Now you may ask yourself, where are we with this proposal? This is a very complex graphic which describes where we are. Basically, we are in this red point, sometime between the elections of the European Parliament of last year and the new program that has to start in January 2021. We are here in this MFF, multiannual financial framework, the, the, the budget negotiations, it's, it's the heart of the matter. 
But if you ask yourself why it takes so long since 2018, you can see that since the Commission proposal was adopted, there has been a long negotiation process. The European Council is involved. The European Parliament is involved, the different bodies that have to submit an opinion, like the European Social Com Economic and Social Committee, the Committee of the Regions, etc., etc. It's a long negotiation process, and in the middle, we had the European Parliament elections, the new Commission, of course, and, and the negotiation keeps on going. We hope to be ready to start the program in January 2021. Now, indeed, the motto of evolution, not revolution, uh, stays, uh, stays true. We are not changing the proposal in substance. Basically, we want to have a program that is more inclusive and accessible, which is more forward looking with some flagship initiatives like the European universities and the centers of vocational excellence, which are uh, mainly intra European, at least for the time being, more international. I will speak about this now, but also a program that uh, promotes more uh, the European identity and the participation in the European identity and the vision of the, the European values, let's say, in the rest of the world also. A program that is more in synergies with other instruments, and of course, the one that interests us more is the external cooperation instrument, and a simple Erasmus, a program where it is, it's easier to participate for the stakeholders, for the participants. About the budget that interests you more, the European, the international dimension budget, uh, between 2014 and 2020, we have had a budget of uh, more, a little bit more than 3 billion euro devoted to the international cooperation. So I want to emphasize how much will be, how much budget will we have for 2021, 2027? We still don't know because this neighborhood development and international cooperation instrument, the, the funding instrument that will bring money from the external cooperation into Erasmus, the budget is not yet decided. Once the budget of this instrument is decided, part of it will come into Erasmus. We hope, I hope at least, to have as much, if not more, normally more, than we have had until now. But this is something that we cannot promise for the time being. What we will continue to have is a mixture of funding between the internal instrument and the external instruments. In this very complex pie chart that you see, what you see to the left, which is called Heading 1, it's basically the Erasmus program budget as such and all the other parts of the, of, the, of the chart is the external cooperation instruments that currently exist that, exist, that give us budget to fund the cooperation with the other parts of the world. The one that interests you more is the, the one that is called ENI, European Neighborhood Instrument. This is the one that funds cooperation with the South Med countries. But from 2021, all these instruments, except IPA, Instrument for Pre-Accession, will be replaced by a single instrument. But the neighborhood normally will continue to be the biggest priority and the South Met, I hope, will continue to be the biggest budget envelope within the neighborhood. Now, when we discuss changes, I have to emphasize these are possible changes, as I say, possible changes. We want to make Erasmus better, but we still do not know everything because at the same time that the budget negotiations are ongoing, we are negotiating with the bodies that have to implement the program. In the case of the Erasmus Plus program countries, is the national agencies, in particular for this uh, ICM activity. The idea is that we will continue to have what we have now, but it should be better. So uh, we are doing some things to, to make it easier for participants to, to participate in the program. For instance, some ideas are applications per regions instead of per country, because they, this gives more flexibility if you apply for a region instead for a very specific country. We want to raise organizational support. That is the amount of money that we give uh, to universities to fund all the, 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 the overheads, the, the, the funding that it's not related to a grant itself, but for instance, for visa, for insurance, that's the unit cost also. We want to raise this, this amount of money. We are thinking of opening this mobility to recent graduates, not just to, to students that, are, uh, still, that have still not graduated. We are thinking of having targets for inclusion. Inclusion is a very important subject, as I said. So we really want to, first to, to promote that disadvantaged students, at, but also universities that are not currently participating very much in our programs uh, are better represented in Erasmus+. 
shorter mobilities, but I would say it's, it's not to have only shorter mobilities, but to have in addition shorter mobilities. Why? Because they are sometimes more inclusive, but these shorter mobilities could take many forms. Maybe a student could participate under the Erasmus Plus program in, uh, in summer courses, for instance, uh, or in shorter traineeship periods. But the idea is always to add something to what we already have, not to change it, not to move everything into something shorter. And we are also thinking of having a new category for PhD candidates to participate in, in the mobility students. Uh, but they can already participate, but something more specific because they are in a, in a hybrid position. Sometimes they are considered as regular students. Sometimes they are considered as researchers or sometimes they are considered as staff. So we are thinking of something more specific for them under Erasmus Plus. Of course, the other programs like the Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions for those that are really researchers or the mobility for staff will continue. Then uh, when we said about making Erasmus Plus more international, we are thinking of adding a possible international dimension to KA103. For those of you who are not familiar with the jargon, KA103 is the, intra the current intra-European mobility. We have KA103, the intra-European mobility, and KA107, uh, the extra-European mobility, the one that you participate in. But the funds for KA103 are much more uh, important than the, ones, the funds for KA107. So the idea is that maybe it should be possible to use part of the funds of the intra-European mobility to fund mobility uh, with partner countries in the rest of the world. This would be in principle open to all countries in the world, of course, including the South Met, but also to countries where uh, there is very little budget actually now for mobility uh, under the KA107. This will fund incoming and outgoing mobilities, and it requires, of course, a lot of administrative work. We have to align uh, the grants for international mobility under K103 to the grants for K107, and this is something that maybe you you know. Uh, you know, when in, when a, an international student uh, goes to mobility into a partner country, or a student from a partner country comes to Europe, the grant is much more important than from the European regular Erasmus student. It's something that really allows to fund the whole mobility period. So if we are going to do this, we need to give this level of funding also. The mobility uh, would be possible for all partner countries and for all H holders, you know, the European Charter for Higher Education that the European participants need to have. There would be possibly no qualitative assessment. You know that mobilities under KA 107 have to be qualitatively assessed because uh, there is a lot of competition for this. But under K103, maybe it would be possible to skip this step and to ensure that the European and the partner country universities can have a long-term collaboration and in, 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 in the end, to ensure that the K103 funds are better absorbed. But I need to add the specific details have to be decided later on it will all depend on the final Erasmus budget. If the budget authority does not increase the level of funding to a level that we are expecting, then maybe we would be not so optimistic that this can be done. The expectation is to increase the budget and to be able to do a more international Erasmus program. When it, come to, it comes to the capacity building and higher education program, uh, not many novelties we are discussing for the time being, but I want to explain the main one that we are thinking of, which is to have two strands of projects. Again, with the objective of making the program more inclusive. You know that participating in a capacity building project is very time consuming to prepare an application. It's very difficult. It's really almost for professionals. And what we want is that more universities really can benefit of this action. And then we are thinking of having as front one of a smaller projects, attracting newcomer organizations, maybe simpler projects that really relate only to adaptation of curriculum, to the implementation of short training modules, to the local implementation of the results of previous projects. So these projects would have a smaller budget. We have not decided how much, but maybe it would be maximum 500,000 euro. And we would continue to have the larger projects as we have now, which would be more ambitious. That's one that idea that we are working on. Then I want to speak about some novelties in the program. Uh, as you know, Erasmus Plus program 
uh, in Europe, is really a program open to all sectors of education, including vocational education and training. This is something that we have not had until now with the partner countries. The idea for the new program is to have also capacity building projects in the field of vocational education and training. I think this is very interesting for the partner countries. This would mirror the, the projects that we have in higher education, but uh, in the field of vocational education and training. Of course, higher education institutions can also participate in the project as far as it is linked to VET. So this is something interested for, interesting for them as well. As you see, there are, these are some ideas that we are working on. The idea is to support reform, proce uh, reform processes, to reform the links of VET with the labor market, to increase the link with the local, regional, national strategies, to improve the skills of teachers, and of course, to have mobility activities also. These mobility activities would not be a mobility action in itself, but uh, international exchange activities for staff and learners embedded in these capacity building projects. So we can discuss about this more if you are interested later. Then we want to also have uh, capacity building in the field of youth. As I mentioned before, we have it already now, but it's rather limited. It's only open for Tunisia as a coordinator and we have not a big budget for this. The idea is really to open this. Uh, this was really a pilot almost with Tunisia. We see it's successful, it's interesting to, to open this to all the countries in the South Met region. And then it's uh, multilateral partnerships again, aiming at supporting the internationalization, the exchanges, the cooperation in the field of youth and non-formal learning. With this activity, we often say we want to raise uh, the more disadvantaged, disadvantaged young people that are maybe not participating in higher education. In reality, I see very often that the young people who are in the youth organizations are very qualified, in fact, and they are seeking for a, an international experience. But we want to really emphasize the idea of targeting the young people with fewer opportunities and to work more in the field of non-formal education. And finally, you know, in, in Europe, Erasmus Plus is also active in the field of sport. There is a lot of interest in the partner countries as, as well. And we aim also at having with the increased budget capacity building projects in the field of sports. This would be multilateral, multilateral, multilateral partnerships aiming at supporting sport activities and policy in, in partner countries. I want to emphasize, we are not talking here about professional sport. We are always talking, talking about grassroots sports and, and about sport as a tool for promoting social inclusion, the educational dimension of a sport, the development of individuals. It's not about professional sport. There you can see some examples of topics, integration of migrants, post-conflict reconciliation, promotion of common values and gender equality, and the skills enhancement through sport. Again, higher education institutions will be welcome to participate, of course, in this, in this action as much, in as much as they bring something to the projects in the field of sport, even if the idea is really to raise the capacity of grassroots sport organizations. Finally, I want to, to uh, make a brief uh, pass, to pass quickly to the to some of the challenges for the new Erasmus program 2021-2027. It is very general, you know, the, the, the commission now has, the new commission has six political priorities. These priorities are horizontal. They are really spread all over the commission programs. But Erasmus has to be one of the programs that contributes the most to, to tackle the challenge of these priorities. Of course, I have not included here the challenge of the COVID. We have also the challenge that the, the current health crisis is posing to mobility, to exchanges. We hope to overcome this, but maybe there will have to be some adjustments to the Erasmus program. Maybe we'll have to work more on capacity. Maybe we'll have to work more on virtual. I will speak about this now. But uh, these are the challenges that we want to tackle with the, with the European Commission uh, programs now. The European Green Deal, an economy that works for people, a Europe fit for the digital age, promoting our European way of life, the European values, promoting the role of Europe in the world because Erasmus is a prime tool for uh, the European diplomacy and a new push for European democracy. This is more for the internal part of the program, of course. As for the European uh, Green Deal, really the objective is that Erasmus becomes more carbon neutral and more environmentally friendly EU program. This is a very ambitious objective so that we say towards a carbon neutral and more environmental friendly EU program because of course a mobility, uh, mobility program has some, some uh, impact 
in the climate, but the, the goal is there for mobilities. So we have some ideas that we are working on, taking a stock of the emissions, incentivizing low carbon footprint mobilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also to, to drive participants as a key actors of change, to have many projects and organizations in the field of sustainable development, and to promote also sustainability practices, also through the implementation actors like the Commission, the national agencies, etc. This will be a big priority for the new program. So whenever you think of projects, keep in mind that it is an important priority. I have talked before about the challenge of inclusion. The objective is really that Erasmus work for everyone. I put here the link of a, a consortium a study that has been done on behalf of the commission to promote uh, the, mobile, the, the inclusion, the inclusion of disadvantaged students from partner countries in the ICM mobilities. Some of the recommendations of the studies are to publicize and promote existing opportunities for disadvantaged students, to address more disadvantage, to have more strategies to include disadvantaged students in our mobilities, but also I should say to reach to more, uh, to more high education institutions, for instance, regional universities, not, not only the universities that always participate in the programs, et cetera, et cetera. We have also the, to harness the potential of alumni in the partner countries, this is a challenge that we want to tackle. And last but not least, I want to briefly uh, address the challenge of digitalization, which is now more current than ever, as the current crisis has shown, and we are all working or being educated, learning, taking exams from home. So Erasmus need to needs to be embedded to the priorities of the EU Digital Education Action Plan, that you can read there, making better use of digital technology for teaching and education, developing digital competences and skills and improving education through better data analysis and forecast. The Digital Education Action Plan will be updated towards the end of this year, so there will be new activities under it. Some actions that we have done so far, the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange, of course, you know very well about this, with the South Met region, it's, it's, it started as a pilot, but now it's becoming more and more important because we see that we are going to have to shift some activities maybe to virtual exchanges. Then I, I didn't mention that we have also what we call the digital opportunity traineeships. This is part of the traineeships program that we have, but we have a specific strand, more traineeships that are uh, targeting really digital skills and digital, uh, but in a broad sense, and not just data inputting or working with the computer, but really working with uh, advanced companies in the, in the field of digital. We are also working in the Erasmus Without Paper Network. The idea is to really make Erasmus more digital in the future. This is, for the time being, a European initiative and also the European Student Card Initiative, Student Card Initiative and the Erasmus Plus mobile app, mobile app. The idea is also to help the, make the program more user friendly for the students and for the higher education institutions, making all the activities uh, really digitalized. For the time being, still, this is a pilot and in, in Europe only, but the objective is to roll out by 2025 to all students. With this, I finished my presentation. You can see here a, a map of the European Union and the countries in the neighborhood with which we'll cooperate more closely. And I think I stick to 30 minutes and leave the floor to Marcello. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, Herman. Uh, Thank you very much for this very important presentation about the past, current and past program and the future uh, evolution of the program. Uh, and this very important, I listen in other your presentation, uh, the, the, the movement for the future program. And I'm very uh, happy about some of these uh, uh, the, challenges and changement that you are reflecting on it about ICM and capacity building. Uh, I invite our colleagues, I saw in our participant list that we have around 60 people and I've, I've said not only that there are some familiar name and some colleague from uh, our member universities, but I, I see in particular that we have uh, a very balanced participation from European side and Southern Mediterranean side. This shows us how important it is for both 
a framework of cooperation with, uh, within Erasmus Plus uh, program. Um, okay, I invite, I have some comments, I have some questions, but first I give the floor to some of our participants and Deep and Laurence to invite the first uh, uh, um, questions. If possible, I would like to invite you to make your question personally and not only writing in the chat. If you don't like to talk and you just want to write, let us know, obviously without any problem. But just to in some way animate our session, I will invite you, thanks to Anne Laurence, uh, to make your question directly to Herman or if in case to me. Please, the first one is Lawrence? It's Mustafa Kayali. You can now speak and you have to unmute your microphone. Please, uh, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Very well. Introduce yourself, please. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Okay, uh, my name is Mustafa Kayali. I'm head of international relations department at the Academy of Health Sciences, Syria. Actually, uh, last year we have submitted for the Erasmus program and we have uh, sent all required uh, information and details and unfortunately we get a denied uh, uh, email that we are uh, not, you know, available or we can't uh, get approved. Uh, I don't know the reason for that. So is it possible to resubmit for this year? I mean for... Uh, 2021, and uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to participate. Thank you, Mustafa. I think that we could collect some questions. Uh, Herman, what do you think? Or if you, okay. Uh, please, I think that there is another question coming. Yes, from, from Dorinella Kupi. Dorinella from Albania. You can now unmute your microphone. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, Dorinella. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear in regard to the new framework of 2021 to 2027. Um, based on the fact, and hopefully, if the new framework will be approved on January 2021. Will there be application for funding during the 2021? Thank you. Very, very good question. Very important question too. Also the previous one, the participation of Syria is quite important for all of us. Uh, waiting other questions and before to start with my questions, please, Herman, start with your, your answer and then I give the floor to, we give the floor to Hamad. Yes, yes, uh, to the colleague from Syria. I didn't understand about the application uh, last week because there's, there's no call open right now, as far as I know, for higher education, mobility and uh, capacity building projects. Uh, the call was closed in February. So Syria is eligible to participate, uh, even if we know the difficult situation, but maybe you could clarify what application did you submit. But if it's for a project, there's, as far as I know, there's no call open right now. And for the colleague from Albania, and I'm, I'm sure this interests for everyone, yes. In my diagram, the idea was in January 2021, the program starts. Hopefully, we have a call, uh, as usual, in October 2020. Erasmus uh, Plus is a particularly difficult program within the, within the EU. Why? Because for the vast majority of EU programs, if, they are, if, the, if the program is approved, adopted by December, 2020, imagine, they can still open in 2021 in January and that's fine. But we have to follow the academic year. That's why we always publish the call from one given year in October of the year before. But I really hope that at least for the intra-European Erasmus, which is a very important flagship program, we are ready. That's the part that DGAC is working on. I cannot assure that we will have a call for the international dimension in 2020, in, in October 2020. 
Why? You know, there was a precedent in 2014 when the Erasmus Plus program started because we rely on the funding of the external instrument, maybe the external instrument within which Erasmus is only a small part of the huge external cooperation instrument is not ready by December of 2020. But this we cannot assure because the, it's in the hands of the negotiators, really, which is mainly the European Parliament and the Council. If there was a, a situation like in 2014, where we didn't have a call, you know that the budget was never lost because the budget was then uh, fed into the, into the other years, uh, the following year's calls anyway. But it, 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 is a, it was a pity that we lost a year, it's true. Hopefully the situation will not repeat itself, but it's a possibility that we have to reckon for the international dimension. Now, this is a, a, an important issue because, uh, you know, to, to, to lose one year uh, could uh, impact our activity, our international dimension. We have projects running, of course, but uh, we, I think that in particular for the international dimension, the continuity of our work is surely important. Uh, I, I think that to have a call in October, at least a smaller one, if in case, uh, is surely important to guarantee some continuity, bo both for the mobility, if possible, and for the capacity building, of course. But it's, I suppose that if the program starts in 2021, in any case, in October 21, we will have, in any case, a call, hopefully. Absolutely, because I'm, okay. what, I'm, what I'm saying is that maybe the, the, the legal instrument with the funding is not adopted yet because this happened in 2014. Yeah, sure. I, I don't want to say that everything is going to be so perfect that it won't happen again. Okay, okay. You have to be realistic. This could happen because it happened before. And as I said, Erasmus is only a small part of the yeah, big sure. instrument. And the vast majority of EU programs work this way. They will be ready in December 2020, but for the inter-European Erasmus, I'm certain almost that the legislators, the European Parliament and the Council will do their best to ensure that the citizens, because this is a program where citizens feel it really, if it is not there, are, 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 are ready to participate in it already in this year. Okay. Questions are coming. The next one, if I'm correct, is our friend Hamad Jamal from Lebanon. Hamad, are you there? No, not yet. No, I have to, to allow him just a minute. Okay. Uh, it's have okay. To, okay, Hamad, unmute your micro and the floor is your well, do you hear me? Very well. Thank you. Hello, Marcello. Hello, Silvia. Hello, Mr. German. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I, I see in the presentation that you talked about uh, the call for by region, not by country. Does this mean that in the future call for application for the Erasmus Plus projects, the partners must be from different countries? Or this is what I understand? Or or what? Thank you. Thanks, Jamal. Uh, I think that we can give the floor now to Reem El Kodari. Please, Reem, unmute your micro. Your micro is mute, still mute. Okay, waiting that Rim is uh, uh, available. Hello. Hello, Rim. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the um, informative day. Uh, I was going to ask the same question Mr. Ahmed Jamal would just asked now from Lebanon with, about the participation as a region instead of uh, uh, participating as a country. Um, I don't understand that part in particular, so if you can help us understand more about it. Thanks, Reem. Considering thank that, thank you, thank you very much. Consider that is more or less the same question. I invite another uh, participants. The next one is our colleague and friend Arthur Schmidt from University of Granada. Arthur, 
please unmute your micro. Hello, uh, can you hear me now? Very well. Okay, good, wonderful. I wrote a uh, hello to everybody first of all. I wrote my question in the chat already. Uh, as far as I understood, you said that uh, Erasmus regular Erasmus mobility will be open to partner countries as well. And uh, this will be somehow linked to the ICM instrument. So I have none. Could you a bit comment on that? What do you mean? Do we have a, to have first a, a successful application for the region and then we can, let's say, transfer some funds to that? Or is it in general possible for any region? Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, now I give Herman uh, time to answer, the floor to answer, and then I have also some questions. Please. No, but the call by region, the, the idea is that, you know, now the, in, the, in the application, uh, it, is, it is more rigid because you have to spend the budget with the country that you said you were going to spend it. But it could be possible to apl apply for a given region like the South Met region or the Western Balkans and, and then have the flexibility. They have the flexibility to spend it with different uh, universities in the regions. So the idea is basically to, to give more flexibility, to make the applications less rigid. But the details have to be worked out, really, because we also want to make sure that this flexibility does not give uh, the carte blanche to then uh, only focus on certain universities that you prefer. And we have to ensure that the regional balance with the, the, the balance of the countries in the region is respected also. About the link between K103 and K107, no, it doesn't mean that you need to first submit an application in one to, uh, to have uh, the other. It means that even if you apply to K103 to have a mobility with a partner country, you have to follow the rules of K107, in particular when it comes to the grant levels. You cannot send somebody to a partner country, maybe to the other corner of the world with a grant of 300 euro, for instance. Huh? You have to give a grant level that corresponds to the grants of K107. But that would be under, K under K103. Again, it's a, it's a matter of more flexibility. If universities want to use the, the funds that are much more important under K103 to cooperate with other uh, countries in the world, why not let them do it? Because that's what they ask us to do. But uh, at the same time, it depends, as I said, on having more budget because we have to ensure that the Erasmus program continues to, to its European vocation and dimension to fulfill the role, that it's not like the funding is going to move from K103 systematically to third countries, but rather than the additional funding that is much more important can be used for the K1, for the external countries as well. Thank you, Herman. Also, it's very, very clear. Uh, before to give the floor to the next uh, participants, I have some questions. I, I have a, a lot of questions. I am trying to see if some of them will coming from our members, but uh, in particular about, first of all, again, I come back to ICM. I really appreciate the idea to have a shorter mobility scheme, which is something that we already asked in, in previous Unimed week also, thanks to our colleagues at that time of the University of Bologna that uh, show in a presentation uh, in DG Education in particular during the bilateral with you, uh, how could it be important to have a shorter mobility to improve in some way the north-south mobility, which is, could be uh, also a, a formula. And also the idea of PhD candidates, I think that is quite interesting and challenging. Uh, but about the future, I'm, I have a reflection on, uh, because it's something that is uh, very important to all of us. First, first of all, how to um, improve the visa procedures in a better way possible. You know, this is always a big, big problem because we work to improve this Mediterranean generation, this mobility scheme and so on. And uh, at the end, uh, some time by time, we find some difficulties uh, on the visa procedure. It seems that on one end, the European Commission is giving some opportunity on the other end, uh, the, the, the member states are uh, in preparing, are delivering in visa procedure very complicated to manage. And we lose a lot of time. And I think that a special um, procedure for students under Erasmus Plus program mobility scheme could be uh, something important. Another issue that I, um, I on, on ICM in the picture that in the slide that you show us about the, the, the numbers of mobility, 
the, 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 the participation of Israel is very important in relationship with the number of inhabitants uh, and students, of course. If you compare uh, Israel with uh, 100 million citizens in Egypt, obviously it's not, not possible to make, uh, to compare. Uh, there is uh, something that you are going to introduce to balance the participation of uh, countries. I don't want to say to have quote for countries, but at least to guarantee a balance, because obviously Israel in higher education and the mobility with the higher education institutions with Israel could be considered as a, a Western mobility scheme in some way. Uh, uh, if you are going to co consider this, and also have you in mind to improve in some way or another the North-South mobility scheme? Because I think that it's important to improve as possible, as much as possible. I, I know that students from Southern Mediterranean countries want to come to spend a period in Europe, but also we have to invite our students from Europe to move and to go in the region, why not with the shorter mobility scheme, but to have an experiences in the region. This is the way to create this uh, uh, Mediterranean uh, generation. Okay, before that you answer me, I give the floor to the next, which is, if I'm correct, uh, Ramez Sob. Is it correct? Thank you. Ramez. Please introduce yourself after that you introduce yourself. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Very well. Hello, Marcelo. Thank you for inviting us for this week uh, for Yenemed. And thank you, Chairman, for your perfect presentation. First, I, uh, just I want to uh, ask uh, about some points or uh, ICM changes. I think uh, Marcelo have just explained uh, one point, um, applications by region, not by countries, uh, and that uh, will ensure for all countries of regions uh, an equal opportunities and number of uh, participations from students and staff. Uh, the second point is uh, VHE candidates do you mean um, uh, uh, university employees or students of PhDs? The second one is uh, shorter, um, I think shorter mobilities. Um, is it instead of semester participations for students? And thank you. Thank you, Ramed. Now I give Herman the time to answer and then we move to the next uh, participants. Thank you, Marcello. I start with, with your questions on the visa procedures. Yes, it's a really difficult issue, but I think from what I see in Brussels, at least, we have advanced a lot since the last, uh, since the beginning of the program. In particular, since 2016, you know, we have a special directive. Uh, a directive that was to be implemented fully by the member states in, two, in 2018. But I look for the title because it's rather long. It's on the conditions of entry and residence of third country nationals for the purposes of research, studies, training, voluntary service, pupil exchange schemes, or educational projects and au pairing. This, this is directive the title. Is in force since 2018 and uh, member states have to respect it. This being said, a visa is a very complicated procedure also always, and it can be refused for many reasons that we sometimes don't even know. Like I, I get news that this or that student from that or other country is having problems to get in the visa. Sometimes the obstacles are not even legal, are simply bureaucratic or the of visibility, lack of uh, consulates, difficult accessibility, the cost of the visa fees, this is the issue we're working on. But the member states have to respect this, this directive, which basically facilitates very much the participation in our uh, schemes. That is also one reason why our grants are much more uh, generous than the regular uh, Erasmus Plus grants. 
we cannot expect that a, a student from a poorer country, let's say, has uh, the, the funds available to study. Well, the Erasmus Plus International Grant gives the assurance to the member states that this student is going to be able to self-finance this grant. Also, when somebody is issuing a visa, what do they want to know? They want to know that that person is going to go back to his or her country. They have to either want to get their degree. So that there's, there's a lot of guarantees that we have thought of and worked on to ensure these visa procedures. And we have the, the, the legal tool. But there are still some problems. But I think that it's, it's uh, working little by little better. Also, when more and more consulates in the, in the, of the, of the countries are really aware of the importance of Erasmus Plus. They work with the EU delegations. They discuss all the visa issues together in the given countries. And I think that it's, it's improving substantially. But I, I know that there are still problems in some issues. Uh, about Israel, as uh, Marcello asked me, uh, I ignore if you have some Israeli members with you today. I ignore it completely, but it's true. Israel is really one of the biggest success stories of, of, the, of the Erasmus Plus program as it is now. Why? Uh, well, we could do a study about this, but they are, they are lucky to be in the biggest budget envelope, let's say. They are lucky to be there. They have very attractive universities. And as I said, it's a demand-based program. So it's the European universities that, want to that have to want to cooperate with you. Sure, sure. I see the point. Also, you ask uh, about how to balance more between incoming and outgoing. Eh? Those going to the EU, and those going to the partner countries. Actually, the case with Israel is that it is already much more balanced. It shows that many European universities are interested in cooperating with Israel. So uh, we, we work with this framework because Israel is part of the European neighborhood policy. And it sure. is a European neighborhood policy with the southern envelope that, uh, that works this. So the, so the the way to tackle this problem is, is, of course, not to put a quota on Israel or something, but it's rather to increase the attractiveness and the participation of the South Mediterranean other universities from other countries. That's what we are working on. And this is related, for instance, to the shorter mobilities. When I was in Algeria with you recently, for instance, uh, there was a thought, okay, actually our students, the students from the South Met, they want longer mobilities. They don't want shorter mobilities. But if we want to bring more students from the, from the North to the South, maybe we have to to offer them more possibilities to do short-term mobilities. And then we will bring more numbers. And then they will get to know us and the cooperation will establish because the cooperation is always in the longer term. So okay. this is one possibility also. Uh, again, about, about the application by region, maybe I wasn't too clear, but the idea is to really give flexibility, more flexibility than we have now. Uh, you, you, can, you can apply for, for application to, to, to cooperate with the South Med universities and then with the region, not with the country, and then you can play with it. But there has to be a mechanism to ensure the non-discrimination indeed. We want to ensure that uh, we will have uh, the, the, the better balance uh, uh, projects, in fact, that's the objective. Eh? Sometimes what happens now is that because they are so uh, tightly linked to a given country, if a mobility cannot happen, then it's not possible to uh, do it with another country. Then we want to be more flexible in, in general. That's the, that's the key rule. I want to emphasize again also, however, that already the South Med region is the biggest budget priority. We will not go as far as to break this. This is already a policy choice in itself because if we gave total freedom to European universities, okay, this is the budget for uh, international mobility. Spend it in whatever part of the world you want. Maybe the South Met is not the biggest priority. Maybe they want to cooperate more with uh, Latin America, with, uh, uh, with these uh, emerging countries from Asia, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, those regions have very little budget. We are telling them, if you want to benefit from this budget, you already have to do it with the South Met. But we want to increase the flexibility within the region to make it easier, to, to more attractive to participate in this. There was the question about the PhD candidate. Again, this is something we are thinking of. Now, uh, the PhD candidate will be considered plainly as a student if he participates, he or she participates in the ICM scheme or as a staff, if he goes as a staff, they can fall under both categories. But we are thinking of having something specific for PhD candidates to boost the, the, the dimension of the, 
of the doctoral programs also. That's another possibility to increase the participation. We can sell more PhD candidates to the partner countries because they are less concerned about recognition of courses and these kind sure. of uh, issues. They can do their research, but not as a researcher, but as a students in the partner countries. This is a way to boost immobility also. We have, of course, for researchers as such, the Maria Sklodowska Curie Actions, that you will have a very good webinar uh, next week with my colleague, Celine. But this is an extremely competitive program, an excellence program. You don't need to be a Maria Sklodowska Curie researcher, because it's also a, a long investment, this application, to benefit from a mobility period. We want to make it more uh, friendly for PhD candidates and the Erasmus Plus. And about the short-term mobilities, I think I answer more or less. The idea is to give, again, more flexibility. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really a, a choice that now the minimum period is one semester, normally at least three months. But if a student wants to go to Algeria to know the, Europe, the university, to take a summer course, a researcher, a PhD candidate wants to do some research for one, two months in Algeria, and even there are summer academies where we can send Erasmus students or even we can welcome uh, Erasmus students from the South Med in these summer academies. Why is that not possible now? We should make it possible probably if the, if the budget allows for it. Always the idea to do more, not less. <laughs> Thank you. We have to run with other questions. So time by time, we are used to, to have a nickname. And this is the time to invite a navigator with us. <laughs> Please, I can't re ask you to introduce yourself by name and by institution. And to make your question, uh, please unmute your mic. Please. No, we can't listen to you. I don't know what's happened. I think that in the meantime, waiting that the problem is solved. Can you hear us? Okay, we move to the next uh, in the meantime. I hope that everything will be solved soon. I, I, I go to the next participants, uh, Alicia Betts from the University of Girona. Alicia, please. Alicia? Marcello, if I may, I see many questions in the chat. Alicia? Alicia? Okay. Uh, I think that eventually we could answer to the chat in the meantime because. Alicia? Si de la collecta, si mute, de la Alicia, mute Alicia, please, waiting uh, that. Uh, uh, okay, we could invite, uh, we have as a, a costis, uh, as uh, we have also uh, as a participants uh, uh, external organization uh, that we have a, a memorandum of understanding with the European Student Network and we have with us Costis Giannidis, which is the president. Please Costis, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Very well, very well. Great, great. Uh, thank you, Marcelo, and thank you, everyone, for organizing this very interesting webinar. And, uh, Herman, thank you for all this very nice uh, information. Um, as Marcelo said, I am from the Erasmus Student Network. Uh, we are basically an organization that's supporting international students to integrate in the local society. Uh, my, my question, I think it was already answered in a previous one, but I was wondering, you mentioned that part uh, of Key Action 103 uh, mobilities um, will be spent for extra European mobility. And I wanted to ask if this is optional for universities or they have to actually use a, a certain percentage of the Key Action 103 funds to uh, send uh, students uh, for extra European uh, mobility. Thank you, Kostis. Um, it's important your contribution and as you as you, some of our participants know as a member we are trying to uh, join forces to uh, improve the students organization in southern Mediterranean countries and why not to, to invite the students to be more active in uh, university life I try again to invite a navigator that we discover which is our friend that professor Tessitore from uh, University uh, 
Il Foro Italico di Roma. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Marcello, for Thanks, your introduction and for also to organize this very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, I have very two quick questions for uh, German. I'm Antonio Tessitore from the University of Rome for Italico and also the UNIMED Tube Network on Sport and Physical Activity. Uh, my first question is, in uh, your first slide, you, were me you mentioned uh, about the Erasmus actions open to the South Med countries. And then you mentioned sport in the slide of capacity building. So my question is, it's only that the main field or uh, the South Med countries will be involved in all the calls of the Erasmus sport. And the second question is, you mentioned the sport also in the Erasmus, Erasmus goes green slide. And then if you can give some, an example of involvement or sport in, the, in, the, in this field. Thank you very much. Please, um, thank you, Antonio. Please, Ahmed. Thank you. But a question from the Erasmus Student Network. Well, the details are not known yet, but I don't think there will be an obligation to spend first parts of the KA 103 funds in international mobility. It depends on your applications. It will, it, if it exists in the end, as I hope, it will be a, an additional possibility. Because right now, you know that we have uh, many funds for uh, intra-European mobility, and we could do more for extra-European, but it will be optional, of course. I understand. But wait to see the details. But I, I don't think it will be compulsory. About the sport issue, yes. In my first slide, I explained the actions that are open to SouthMed currently. And then the second part of the presentation was about the new, uh, the new, uh, the new options for the new program, where we have, hopefully, capacity building in the field of sport. The idea really is to be gradual, not to open the whole program to the whole world, also because we have to see the balance of the funding. Eh? There's the funding that comes for the, from the intra-European budget and the funding that comes from the external cooperation budget. So we have to target those activities that offer biggest added value and we think it's a capacity building at least for the time being. So no, it would not be to open the whole partnership that we have in Europe to the rest of the world, but only to have capacity building the field of sport. But mm -hmm. something that I didn't mention, maybe it needs to be made explicit, mm -hmm. These capacity building projects, either in the field of sport or in the field of med, vocational education and training, normally they can have also mobility activities. Eh? You can have a capacity building project that embeds some mobility activities, if mobility is the one that you are more interested in. But wait to see the details until we have the new program. Uh, you wanted me to mention some example of how to integrate the green in the field of sport. Well, it's not for me to give, uh, I'm not the expert in sport, but uh, really I'm sure it's possible to integrate the green in the field of sport. I can tell you that I have seen many examples of integrating the green dimension in the field of youth. Really the, the field of sustainability and in green dimension of the programs really mobilizes a lot of young people. There are many NGOs working on that. So there are many projects uh, in the field of capacity building then of youth that develop sustainability projects. This can be, for instance, linking NGOs from the north and the south on how to recycle, to clean beaches, to integrate sustainability practices in youth organizations, in schools. I am sure in the field of sport, maybe you have to be a bit more creative, but it's possible probably, no? So it's, it is really, we, we, we create the tools and it is the project promoters such as Unimed and others that really have to be in the creativity of how to make the best proposal that surprises us. Uh, I don't know if there was some more question. Yeah, there, is, uh, the, uh, there are some more questions, the last uh, round of questions, then I have also some other questions. Uh, in particular, a comment on this new opportunity for capacity building. I would, would like just to add for our members that capacity building on the uh, on, on that is important because in, in several southern Mediterranean countries, universities are also VET provider, and this is an important opportunity to improve also the quality of uh, VET uh, trainers and so on. I think that the capacity building for youth is also an important tool in the view of to improve the students' organization. Why not? to give some uh, contribution to the, the, the academic improvement in, in the region. 
it's a pity that you are not uh, looking to professional sport because you know uh, we all of us are professional on sport <laughs> but it's very interesting because in, in unimed we launched some years ago as professor tessitore said the unimed subnetwork on sport and this idea to cooperate on academic level in the region on sport dimension to create opportunity that move from the academic side to the intercultural dialogue through sport, of course, is quite interesting and challenging for all of us. Okay, now the round uh, set of questions. I don't know if there is someone else, but we start first with uh, Palestine with Professor Derar Leyan. Derar? Hi, hello. You hear me? Very well, please. Hi, my friend, how are you? Marcelo, how are you, Silvia? How are you, everybody? Thanks for the presentation and uh, for the actually for the invitation for the for the week uh, for the information week. Uh, I have noticed that uh, the ICM is uh, minimal within the UNIMED members, so I'm just wondering uh, what role can uh, UNIMED play or promote the ICM? within its uh, members because it is uh, we we are in under the umbrella of the unimed we are partners and the program countries so how can we uh, facilitate the icm between the partner and the uh, program countries under the umbrella of the unimed i think maybe this will be put on the agenda for october maybe a meeting and this will be, I think, uh, a good opportunity also and uh, achievement for the for the UNIMED. Also, the uh, the ICM, uh, especially for Palestine, we have just one direction of uh, of mobility with the program countries. So, how can we promote the uh, bi-directional and welcome uh, students from uh, program countries? to visit Palestine. So the, the, the picture is still that there is no security in Palestine. There is no, um, so this is like uh, the uh, propaganda, but in, in the other side, as Marcelo said, in Israel, we have 11,000 or 12,000 of student mobility. So we are in the same area. And I think we are uh, secure the same as Israel. So. So how can we promote students to come from other countries to Palestine? Thank you again very much for this uh, nice opportunity. Thank you, Derar. Uh, I, I will uh, answer later to, to your comment. I give now the floor to Esmeralda Doku. Please, Esmeralda, introduce yourself and unmute your mic. Are you there? Esmeralda? Okay, I'm uh, waiting that the micro of Esmeralda is working. I give the floor to our friend Kar Stockel from Brussels, I suppose. Kar? Kar, your micro? Okay, we move to the last one. Eventually, we are going to read the questions if they are already written their question. Begona, Eero, I, I suppose that I read the right way. Are you there? Okay, Begona, please. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Can you hear me? Very well. Yes. Introduce okay. yourself. Okay, my name is Begonia Serra. I, um, I work, well, my last name is not displayed correctly, but okay. Um, I work at the University of Girona. Um, uh, thank you for this presentation. We've been looking, we have been following the developments of the new program, but it's actually the first webinar we have with someone uh, explaining the new program. So thank you very much. Um, you already answered one of the questions about the PhD students. I understand this is something you are still working on and it's, it's not decided yet. But I was wondering if this also meant that um, we could, for instance, uh, direct joint uh, projects within capacity building also more in the research oriented areas. So for instance, masters, master programs are usually also part, partially uh, research oriented. Could we include, for instance, doctorate programs? I mean, it seems a little bit far going if you're only deciding on PhD students, but 
since the Erasmus Plus program has always been academic oriented, I was wondering if there's going to be a shift towards research. So that's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ligona. I move to read the question of Esmeralda Doku, which is again about the, the, how to apply as a region and not as country, but I think that we already clarified this point uh, that is some flexibility. I, if Carla is not there, uh, Carla, are you there? Okay, I read the question of Carla. How do you foresee interaction between European university alliances, uh, especially those which have a Mediterranean Af African focus and UNIMED? This is a question to me. <laughs> I will try to, to answer, but I have also uh, some question on the, the university alliances. Uh, then I think that uh, there is the last question from Jose Martinez, University of Granada. Um, my question is about travel support. It will be again based on the official distance cal calculator. Many times the travel support do not correspond to the real cost. Thank you for the presentation, Kim Regards. I think that this will be more clarifying once you move to instruction for the program. But if you have any comment on this, and just I give my uh, last uh, comment. Uh, uh, I agree with the improvement of capacity building that you mentioned, the, the, the shorter and the, the small capacity building and so on. I totally, we will support you in Jamone. We will try to convince university by university to submit uh, a Jamone proposal because it's important also to know European dimension if you want to work with them. And this is important to include in uh, academic courses. Uh, you mentioned virtual exchange that will uh, be surely important for the future. This means, if I understand correctly, that the program will move from pilot to a stable initiative, looking also to other region and not only the Southern Mediterranean, but also probably Western Balkan, I suppose. And if you have any idea on how it works for the future, because you know that UNIMED is a member of this consortium that is leading uh, the virtual exchange project. And then last uh, question about uh, EU universities alliances. Uh, why not to launch a pilot on EU uh, Southern Mediterranean alliances? Do you think that we could foresee in the next future a sort of Euro-Mediterranean alliances to invite universities to cooperate on a stronger basis instead of to cooperate time by time through ICM and through capacity building. Those are my question. I give you now the floor and then I will answer to the question that you were addressing to me. Please, Armando. Thank you. Just quickly to the colleague from Palestine. Uh, actually, I want to dispel that myth that Palestine is not welcoming many students. It is. It is not as Israel, but it is in the normal. The figures that I have for 2015 to 2019 speak of 1,800 Palestinians coming to Europe, but almost 900 Europeans going to Palestine. And from what I know, uh, European students and staff are very interested and very happy to go to Palestine. And unfortunately, sometimes because of the Palestinian side, it's easier to organize that mobility flow than the other one. You should not be unhappy that two-thirds of uh, Palestinians benefit and one-third go to Palestine because that's roughly the proportion that we have in all countries. That's exceptional. And when we speak to our colleagues in the external directory generals, they are happy about this because they consider that the funding is for the Palestinians, for the third country. We have to explain them. Actually, it needs to work both directions because we need to engage the European University as well. So we need to keep at least one third of participants in the other countries. But I think Palestine is definitely a very attractive uh, study destination and a very interesting experience from what I hear. And the Palestinian universities are so active also in capacity building of higher education that they are really one of the biggest players there. So it's, it's a very satisfactory performance in the program. About the question on, uh, I think it was again on the regional applications. As I said, there is a flexibility again, but please consider that everything that I have explained today, it's ideas. You are privileged to have a webinar 
on ideas that we are discussing on. I would like to come here and say, listen, these are the rules of the new program. We have the program guide and everything is crystal clear. Actually, we are debating these ideas now. So that's uh, how you get a, 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 to see what we are thinking of, but nothing is, is for sure what we discussed to date. On the uh, joint projects in the field of research, well, that is actually uh, something that we have to clarify. There are different programs in the EU. We have uh, Horizon 2020 and we have uh, Erasmus Plus. And within the South Med region, already two countries fully participate in Horizon 2020, which are Israel and Tunisia. So it, we have to make clear that when it is a research project, it is a research project. It has to be submitted to Horizon. When you want to increase capacity of research staff, when you want to, to develop the capacities of the universities, when you want to link to the wider world, including the research institutions, if it's a capacity building project, it's up for Erasmus Plus really, for the universities more. But if it's a research project, it's for Horizon. And sometimes I see applications in capacity building higher education where I have to say, I'm sorry, but this is more for Horizon. This is not for Erasmus Plus. There is no capacity building dimension here. It is really a joint research project. Then you have to go through the other channel. About, I'm reading the questions a little bit with no order, the travel support, uh, the distance calculator. I cannot tell you if we will continue to use the distance calculator, but for sure I think, that's my thinking, we will continue to use the lump sums and the simplified grants. Yeah. Why? Because this is a cornerstone of the program. Uh, the, the program is uh, worldwide rich. It would be impossible to manage if we were going to work on the basis of, of real costs as a rule. But there are always exceptions. Then you can work with the national agencies and with the executive agency for their centralized projects for the exceptions, the clearly justified ex exceptions. For instance, when it, it comes to disadvantaged students with a physical disability that needs a special support for the traveling, when there is a clearly justified uh, reason why uh, the, the cost of travel clearly exceeds uh, the, 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 the lump sum that we provide. Keep in mind, however, also that Erasmus Plus is a program that has another key principle, which is co-funding and, uh, well, exactly, co-funding, no? So we are not supposed to cover with these lump sums the whole cost of the program, but it is really different for the partner countries where we really want to, co to give full grants. But the, the co-funding dimension has to be there with the lump sums also. Huh? So that's especially important when it comes to capacity building projects. So distance calculator, yes or no, but lump sums, simplified grants for sure. If we were working with thousands of students and participants submitting their invoices, their real cost, it would be impossible to manage this program. Uh, about the Jan Monet, just, uh, yes, I really, I'm really happy that you are able to promote Jan Monet. I have to say, we found lots more of Jan Monet projects in countries with much smaller Erasmus Plus cooperation budget. Like for instance, I went to Taiwan last year and I saw a wonderful Jan Monet Center of Excellence in Taiwan. And I wonder how many we have in the South Med? Well, we have only one in Israel. <laughs> how come we only have one Jan Monet Center of Excellence in the South Mediterranean region? Well, maybe because they don't have such a big budget for capacity building higher education, for mobility, then they, they use more, uh, they use better the other opportunities that are there. Because Jamon is open to the whole world, there's no regional envelope, it's competitive. But yeah. my, my point is that, what do we need the experts on the EU matters? More in the neighborhood probably. So yes. Yeah. About the virtual exchanges, you know, as I said that, it, is, it, it was a pilot, it's, a, it's just a pilot, but really the COVID crisis has increased interest for everything that is virtual. So I cannot say, you know very well, we are in the middle of the negotiations, what format, what a scope, but uh, the pilot, we were lucky that it was first with the South Met, but really we see the value. If it continues, I would expect it to be more open to other countries. Maybe to more players, we could have several projects at the same time running based on the methodology of virtual exchange. Now it's a tender, you know, it's directly managed by the commission, but, uh, we, would, we could have the project format where, the, where the, the universities are really the owners of the virtual exchanges. We will see. It's something that is very interesting and I hope, that it, I hope personally that it will continue, but we will see. 
and about the European universities. Uh, the European universities are still a pilot, so it would be a pilot within a pilot to create the SouthMed. Uh, it, it is already, a, at, the, at this stage, it's a very EU-focused initiative, but at the same time, each European University Alliance has a particular focus, something that they are specialists on. And we have this European University that is specialist, want to focus its strength on, uh, on, the, on the South Met and Africa in general, huh? the CIVIS Alliance. Will we have joint pilots in the future? I don't know, I cannot tell. It is not on the table now, but things develop little by little. One keyword of the future program is the flexibility. So maybe in 2021, we start with a European universities program that is only for European Union member states. And in 2027, we have something more flexible. We will see. We have to collect the, the, the results of the first pilots first. Sure. Personally, because I work with the South Met Cooperation, I would like it very much, but we'll have to wait and see. That's all. Thank, for now. thank you. There is a very quick uh, question uh, from uh, our friend from Gaza, Nabil Laila, regarding the. But please, Nabil, if you are able, because uh, I can't say that we don't have time for uh, our friend from Gaza. Please, Nabil, are you there? Your micro is mute. I don't know what's happened. Okay, uh, Nabil. Okay, the question of Nab Nabil. You hear me? I don't hear you actually. Now everything is okay. Please make. Please introduce introduce yourself. Make soft, your question. Uh, Are you there? Soft, uh, Doesn't work. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, the question, Nabil, again, I try again. Uh, uh, here, I will ask uh, Marcelo about uh, a, a traveling cost, actually, uh, because uh, here we are traveling, uh, when we travel to Spain or to Italy, we are traveling to, uh, from Gaza to Cairo. And uh, these costs uh, is not included in the ASEAN budget. Uh, uh, because of that, uh, uh, what is the next for the uh, next call of the 2001 uh, related to the uh, extra cost we are paying? Uh, that, uh, because uh, normally in normal countries, who is traveling is traveling from Cairo or from his uh, country directly to Europe. But for us in Gaza, we have to travel from Gaza to Egypt and we are paying at like two, three hundred US euro more. And these things are not included in the uh, ICM budgets for the payment. That's my question, please. Thank you, Nabil. Th this is uh, well, so a, a financial question, but it's, so it's a very important so. question, very important question, sensitive question for participation of Gaza colleague to our initiative. Please, Herman, if you have a brief comment on this, and then we go to... Yes, to I need, I'm, I'm very aware of this program. This is an example of how the, 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 the blanket rule for the whole world, distance calculator, from point A to point B, you are paid so much, and maybe you are in an enclave where transport options are very limited, and your cost is very high. So what we are doing now, we are working really on the inclusion of the new program. We are now collecting feedback from the in this case from the National Erasmus Plus office in Palestine, about how to improve the organizational support first. The organizational support that has to facilitate the mobilities is the extra funds to facilitate the mobilities between the partner, from the partner countries. And then we have to see how we distribute this organizational support that currently stays often in the, in the, in the lead of the partnership, which is in Europe after all, no? So we are working on how to increase some flexibility in the case of capacity building high education projects with Gaza, for instance, we already can accept uh, exceptional costs for mobility, for travel, but we have to keep to integrate this also in the, in the, in the case of ICM indeed. And we are working on these issues towards the future program. Indeed. For the time being, we don't have a solution, but I have to tell you, we are very happy every time we hear of mobilities from Gaza that are successful. So we have uh, quite a few until now, and, and we really appreciate the effort that everyone puts in making them a reality. 
because it shows how we can uh, it shows how we can reach the hardest spots, and then it's it's a good uh, a good uh, thing for the program really to achieve this. Thank you, German. I have some last comment uh, to conclude this session. Uh, one point to our participants is very important to talk with the national Erasmus officer in the country to uh, introduce through through the, Erasmus, the national Erasmus officer your questions, your problem, the critical issues that this all these move to the commission. The commission normally listen and react time by time, slowly, but react. It's not, uh, it's not something that doesn't work. The, 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 the discussion with the commission is the way, is something that must be produced with a bottom-up approach and first discussing with the National Erasmus Officer that in particular in Palestine is very active, but I know many of them, they are very active. I went to Palestine recently last year to present uh, the, the, the Erasmus virtual exchange, and we did a, a great job all together. And I agree with uh, Dirar that uh, Palestine is a fantastic and secure place for our mobility scheme. And I hope that we will be able jointly with Herman, why not, to organize uh, in the future an Erasmus session, uh, web, an Erasmus meeting, not I only in West Bank. <laughs> Not only West Bank, but why not also uh, in Gaza? As, as there are said, UNIMED can play a role on ICM. Surely we could support you. As you know, the, the ICM are presented by European University through the national agencies. Uh, in every European countries, there is a national agencies that collect all the uh, call for proposal and then finance directly at national level. This means that are the European universities that define their strategy uh, on mobility for their students and to have mobility from Southern Mediterranean country in our case. And on this, we could try to influence as much as possible all our European members. And of course, to put in, in contact as we do normally our members to improve their mobility and their international relation. Obviously, we can do something more. Uh, on this and please count on us to support your proposals on the mobility scheme. About the university alliances, pro the question proposed by Carl Stokel from um, ex Marseille University, but I suppose that is, be, uh, is based in the office Brussels. Surely we are trying at least to be in contact with university alliances network. Uh, we are associated partner in a couple of them just to guarantee a Southern Mediterranean perspective, or at least to try to influence European universities to have a Southern Mediterranean perspective is a new for all of us. Uh, and I think we are probably with Ex Marseille also with Barcelona and other proposals. And I hope that uh, soon we will uh, be open a, a pilot to have a, a Euro-Mediterranean university alliances and we will put on written paper all this to the commissioner why not to open the door uh, to this um, and i hope also that the future program will have a, a, a window to crisis situation because unfortunately in our region we have crisis situation in the previous program in the current program i have to say correctly uh, we had a special window for refugees in time by time we had some special window to support for instance that Tunisian transition, and now we have the support uh, external window for Algeria. But I hope that the flexibility will give us the opportunity, why not, to continue to work to support, for instance, uh, Yemen, uh, Iraq, and the reconstruction of university in Syria, which is obviously uh, is an important tool for the reconstruction of the country. As you probably know, we define a Libya Restart report, which is an analysis of the Libyan education system, uh, which is you can download in our website. Uh, next week, we will have a session on 24 of June dedicated to the Libyan universities. And I invite all of you to join us because it's an important case. And I hope that the future Erasmus program will give us some opportunity to work in particular situation where crisis is affecting the country. And of course, this means is affecting university in itself. Last point about virtual exchange. 
uh, I agreed with the idea that a virtual exchange must be included also in programs, generally speaking, in ICM or in capacity building or in, in some cooperation program. But the risk is that we wait one year before that everything is re will be settled. Uh, because the program will start, in any case, we we'll launch the call in October 21. And I think that in this way, we risk that we stop one year. Uh, don't, if the fact that you don't see, don't think to have a, uh, a sort of platform to manage all this, but giving the, the university the freedom to manage by in itself, I think that must be very well uh, managed because otherwise it could become something very complicated to manage. And last, very last point, as I mentioned you, I would like to launch a, a, an initiative to analyze the impact of capacity building projects. We discussed it several times. Now we are at the end of the program. Unfortunately, it's, in, it's not possible to organize conferences at the moment, but I will in, uh, reflect what is possible to do in terms of, of analysis uh, on, uh, uh, on capacity building project online, making a survey, inviting uh, projects to discuss and to share ideas in online tools and so on, because it's important to have an overview of all these projects. I stop here because we are 20 minutes in the day and uh, thank you to all the to all participants for your very active participation. I remind you that the webinar is recorded and will be published in our website. If you have any other questions related to the topic, please send us and we will try to arrange eventually another set of questions to Herman or if we are able to answer uh, directly. I have to thanks obviously Herman Bernard Rios for his active and very passionate uh, presentation and, and active contribution. Uh, this is important because uh, sometimes we talk about the European bureaucracy, but it's important to mention that there is also people passionate that work for the benefit of our region. Can you hear me? Sorry, my laptop is going to... Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry the battery of my laptop. I was saying that sometimes we talk about, I don't know where you arrived, but sometimes we talk about the EU bureaucracy, but we have also people passionate in uh, EU uh, directorate services and uh, Herman is, and his colleagues, of course, uh, are very, uh, very passionate. I uh, thank you, obviously, Al Laurence Pastorini and Silvia Marchionne from Unimed team and all our colleagues that are working very hard for the UNIMED week uh, in Brussels. Tomorrow, we will have a session dedicated to the uh, Tunisia uh, education system, talking about the reform process of Tunisia um, education system, as I say. And Friday, we will have a session on mobility jointly with the Erasmus Student Network and um, members of the DIRMED project, a project led by uh, UNIMED. The mobility is an important tool, but it's not only important to talk about mobility in concrete terms, but also in the political framework. How is important the mobility for the, for the political framework and for the intercultural dialogue? I stop here. See you tomorrow, hopefully, for the uh, webinar on Tunisia and Friday on uh, the mobility scheme. And next week, we will have a very huge sessions of webinars uh, talking about, again, DG Education. We will have a, se we will have a session with, on Thursday, 25th, about Maris Krodoske Curie Action, but also about the EU, Africa, European Union, and Africa cooperation, which is another important tool and is a new for UNIMED uh, members and network. Thank you and uh, see you soon online and hopefully see you soon face to face. Bye. Ciao, Herman. Ciao, Silvia. Ciao, Lorenz. Thank you. Bye bye.